Well, good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome you to our first virtual Central Florida Transportation Planning Group meeting. I'm Judy Pizzo, Transportation Planner for the Florida Department of Transportation, District 5 out of Deland, Florida. I am the Project Manager for the Central Florida Transportation Planning Group, or CFTPG. These meetings have been held quarterly by the department since 2007. The platform provides a forum for transportation engineers, planners, and our local government partners to learn about local transportation initiatives, hot topics, transportation trends, and upcoming projects while receiving professional development credits. The CFTPG is supported by a board of advisors represented by the department's District 5 staff and Turnpike staff, local government, industry representatives, and University of Central Florida engineering and planning professors. Additional information on future and past meetings, who our board members are, may be found on the Fasutimus online, that's the F-S-U-T-M-S online, maintained by the department's forecasting and trends office. Now, connected and autonomous vehicles has been a strong topic of interest amongst our attendees. The last time we had a panel on CAV was in 2018, and we decided to bring it back due to consistent interest and the rapid changes in this technology. This meeting was originally scheduled for April of this year and had to be canceled in response to the health crisis. Additionally, the department has developed CAV readiness guidance and are currently developing policy goals. For further information regarding this, please contact Dr. Raj Honaluri, that's Raj, R-A-J dot P as in Paul, O-N-N-A-L-U-R-I at D-O-T dot state dot F-L dot U-S. I would like to thank, additionally, Cutter, and Florida LTAP for offering to host the meeting as a webinar and making it accessible to a statewide audience. I would also like to thank our wonderful panelists for joining us today and for also being flexible with the rescheduling of this event and accommodating the virtual format. There are two more CFTPG meetings planned for the remainder of this year, one in October and the other in December. If you are already on our email database, you will receive the invite. If you are not on our email list and would like to attend, please take the time to complete the feedback survey at the end of the webinar to let us know how we did on this session and recommend topics you're interested in learning about in future sessions. Today's panel is being moderated by Dr. Robert Bertini. He's the Executive Director of the Center for Urban Transportation Research and a Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of South Florida. He is also the Director of the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Institution for Congestion Reduction. His primary research and teaching interests are in sustainable transportation, traffic flow theory, intelligent transportation systems, public transportation, big data, and proactive traffic management and operations. He chairs the Transportation Research Board Operations Section and received the National Science Foundation Career Award. Dr. Pertini earned his Bachelor of Science from California Polytechnic State University and his Master's from San Jose State University. His PhD from the University of California at Berkeley Dr. Bertini has recognized as a fellow with the American Society of Civil Engineers and the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and as a senior member with IEEE. With that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bertini. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Judy, and good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining for this uh, fantastic CFTPG meeting. And I want to thank uh, also the LTAP team, as well as FDOT, for supporting this, um, this format and this great panel that we have. So uh, I think to kind of set up the, the discussion that we're going to be having over the next couple of hours, um, there's a lot happening in our, in our world right now with uh, uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic that we're all dealing with. So first I wanna say that I hope everyone is doing okay and staying 
safe and well. Transportation is uh, an exciting arena with the advancement of technology, and we all rely on transportation um, every day for, for everything that we do. And I think during these last few months, we've had the chance to, to reflect a little bit on how much we rely on transportation for the movement of goods. We've had insights into um, changes from daily commuting to working at home, which is uh, basically a teleworking environment. And so we've been able to think about, well, how, how can we learn from this, this transition that we've all had to make? And in the area of connected and autonomous vehicles, as Judy mentioned, this is a topic that has been on the top of mind for a number of years. And I think particularly here in Florida, um, there's been a lot of effort to, to bring connected and autonomous vehicle technology uh, not only into the laboratory and into the research environment, but out into practice. So we have a number of I think at least uh, tw about 22 projects across the state that FDOT is, is involved with uh, that is putting connected and autonomous vehicle technology out uh, in the field uh, for uh, pilots and for deployment purposes. Florida also hosts the annual uh, Florida Automated Vehicle Summit, which is another form forum for bringing public, private, and academic sectors together. So we're gonna have uh, some panel presentations and um, I think we're, uh, we're gonna have plenty of time at the end for uh, discussion and questions. And I noticed that, that some folks have already um, inserted some questions. And so we, we look forward to, to getting our panelists uh, to answer those. Before we start, um, Kristen is gonna help um, run a couple of polling questions just to just to get a sense of where all of our participants are in this space. So Kristen, are you ready to do the mentee for the first question? Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, if you go to menti.com, use the code 1242958. That'll be the same code all day. And we just want to um, find out. So a connected vehicle is one that and so what you're gonna to wanna to do is choose from the, uh, the choices there on your screen and, and let us know your response there. And it looks like we are getting an overwhelming 100% uh, <laughs> here, uh, Dr. Bertini, on, yes. on communicates with surrounding infrastructure and other vehicles. A uh, few yes, other responses coming in. The term connected vehicle is one that is, has been used um, kind of starting from the US Department of Transportation. Uh, it's also used by auto manufacturers sometimes to mean something different because it, so there can be some confusion about what a connected vehicle actually is. So it seems like we're getting some, some good responses um, on option two, connected vehicle communicates with surrounding infrastructure and other vehicles. Um, so, May I reveal the correct answer, Kristen? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, the second one that, that we have 95% response, that's, that's when we talk about connected vehicle is one that is able to wirelessly communicate with, in, with devices in the infrastructure, so roadside devices, as well as with other vehicles. And this means all vehicles, whether it's freight or passenger, transit, uh, even bicycles, motorcycles, and pedestrians. So the key is communication, wireless communication. Um, we, we don't necessarily mean that it, uh, you know, these vehicles can all be different. They should be coordinated so that they're all able to communicate with one another. Of course, they'll be produced by different manufacturers. Uh, it doesn't involve uh, replacing human driving or uh, physical connectivity to other vehicles. So. Seems like that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good result uh, for this first question. Um, All right, sounds good. So shall we go to the next one? Yes. All right. So this next one, we want to test your knowledge on uh, an autonomous vehicle. So let us know which of these uh, would pertain to an autonomous vehicle. So yes, again, 
an autonomous vehicle. There are, I would say, you know, one issue that comes up sometimes is the terminology that we use. So some people talk about automated vehicles while others talk about autonomous vehicles. Uh, the previous question was about connected vehicles and the, the title of our of our seminar today is CAV, Connected and Autonomous Vehicles. So I think this, this relates to some of the debate about, uh, about how we divide up this field into different uh, and integrate different technologies so that they can all work together. All right. I should mention, I'm not sure if, if anyone has mentioned yet, but we have over 300 people participating as of now. So I want to thank you all for, for joining us. It's incredible, the, the participation. And it looks like, yeah, we're about, we closed the voting. So yes, the 91% the say uses computers to take over human driving tasks, such as steering, braking, et cetera. That's a good summary for what an autonomous vehicle is. It's one, of course, that it's a, it's a vehicle at the moment, the, 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 the kinds of vehicles that are autonomous that we've seen um, out in the community, some of them do look just like other other um, passenger cars. Other ones are are smaller and lighter and operate in low speed environments. So those could be um, autonomous shuttles. There are a number of autonomous shuttles being deployed around Florida and around the world. Um, and the the idea of an autonomous vehicle is it's one that doesn't necessarily need to communicate with other vehicles. Chances are pretty good in the future that that when these vehicles are deployed, that the communication piece will be there. And most autonomous vehicles are communicating. Um, mostly they are receiving data, mapping data. Uh, so high resolution map data is uh, what allows them to navigate the, the terrain. Um, and so having updates um, to that map received wirelessly is something that most of them do as well. So there are some communications that happen. So an autonomous vehicle is one that should be able to operate by itself. So the idea of it being remote controlled is not too far fetched, but the idea is that that vehicle shouldn't rely, need to rely on any remote control, like you might control a, a UAV a drone, something like that. So I think with that little assessment of where everybody is in everyone's you know, this is all, you've all received an A grade so far, if I were grading your, uh, this quiz. But I think we'll move to our first speaker, and we really are lucky to have Eric Hill with us as our first speaker. And Eric is the director of TSMNO, Transportation System Management and Operations at Metro Plan Orlando, which is the metropolitan planning organization for the Orlando urbanized area. And Eric is really a national leader in planning for TSMNO, and I actually have known uh, Eric for quite a few years, and so he has been a national leader in um, advocating and taking action in in the area of TSMNO from a planning perspective. So Eric is originally from New Jersey and has worked um, in the transportation field since 1984, and he's worked with the Transit Agency Planning Authority, and he also is a, a former uh, uh, employee of Cutter here at USF. And at Metro Plan, Eric re is responsible for planning and implementing the, the TSMNO strat strategies that use information and communication technologies to enhance the transportation network. He received his uh, BS and his Master of Public Policy from Rutgers University. And let me hand it over to Eric Hill. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bettini, and good morning. Um, thank you for that warm introduction. And I want to thank um, Judy Pizzo, Porna, and Kristen, uh, the, the Transportation or the Central Florida Transportation Planning Group, and LTAP for inviting me to uh, report out on work that we've been doing at Metro Plan Orlando in the area of connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, I want to first uh, start by saying that this work was not to answer the questions about connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, there are myriad questions on this subject um, and we were not set up or we're not, we were not going into this thinking that we were gonna answer the questions. 
we wanted to just look at how we can prepare ourselves for this technology and integrate it into our planning process. So we commissioned this study. Uh, we uh, contracted with WSP and uh, they subcontracted with Global 5 to do the public outreach piece of this work. Um, the tasks are listed here, but in essence, we wanted to just understand how ready Metroplan Orlando, the MPO, is for this technology. Get a view or perspective on our partners, the local jurisdictions and operating agencies, on how prepared they are. And then lastly, we wanted to go out and um, in a, we wanted to interact with uh, our clients uh, in the three counties uh, of Orange, Osceola, and Seminole to see if, or to understand their awareness, um, to inform them, but also <clears throat> to learn from them. And we wanted to be the source for their information on this subject. So uh, we started with doing some uh, foundational research by just looking at what's going on in the industry. Uh, we did a survey of the local jurisdictions to assess uh, the, the level of understanding that staff has. And then we did three workshops where we went to each county and just had an open discussion on this subject. Um, it was preceded by a presentation by me on it. Uh, but it was an opportunity again for us to engage the public on this on their their knowledge of this this technology. So um, I won't um, I guess reiterate all that you've learned uh, briefly from Dr. Bertini's overview of connected vehicles. Um, but part of uh, the outreach effort was to um, educate the public on connected and autonomous vehicles because if you if you go out and you ask anyone um what's a connected vehicle and they're going to chances are they'll tell you that it's, it's a vehicle that drives by itself but that's not the case and i think uh, the description that dr patini went through um is is a good one a good place to start and that's the, the type of knowledge we wanted to get across um to um to our citizens, um, to our boards, and to our committees. And the whole idea is to improve safety, uh, increase mobility, and reduce the congestion that we encounter. And in using this technology, that is the goal. And again, as Dr. Bertini so wonderfully did uh, in educating uh, us on this subject, Autonomous vehicles pretty much take away that some driving functions that we have to we have to take control or be responsible for, um, and and they can be um, connected with other vehicles, connected with the infrastructure, having um, their own uh, artificial intelligence operating um, within the vehicle itself, uh, but it allows the vehicle to again take over. Uh, most of the driving functions that we as humans typically um, take care of. And so we have connected and autonomous vehicles. Um, and uh, just a little joke here, and, and I don't know how true this is, but you know, I don't mind being corrected. Uh, but I was told a long time ago that you can call a malt a beer, but you can't call a beer a malt. How true that is? I don't know, I didn't follow up to, to see if it was true or accurate or not. However, in this space, you can probably call an autonomous vehicle a connected vehicle, but you can't necessarily call a connected vehicle an autonomous vehicle. And so we have this merger of these two technologies, and this is where the industry is going. And again, we want to, as an NPO, uh, be prepared for it uh, because it is certainly a, um, a change. Um, we're moving, uh, as I like to tell the audience, that we are moving from the 20th century and we're now into the 21st century. And um, the way we did transportation planning uh, in the 20th century is certainly going to change. 
um, and especially for the NPOs, the role that we serve and the value we provide to the industry of, in essence, in the 20th century, we we're building the interstate system and building capacity on the roadways. And in the 21st century, a lot of that's going to be on how do we leverage those investments using information, communication, and technology to improve the experience that we all have, uh, not only in vehicles, uh, but as pedestrians and, as, and as, as cyclists. So as I mentioned early, uh, earlier, um, the first uh, technical memorandum that we did looked at the best pra practices in this area of uh, connecting an autonomous vehicle. And what we uh, recognize is that many of the, a lot of the work that's already been done uh, looks at you know what is germane to the area or location that the technology is being deployed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then uh, the second uh, memorandum that we completed uh, was actual survey of all the local jurisdictions, their staff, most of the respondents were traffic engineers um, and we just wanted to get a sense that um, or a sense of how well they are informed and, and what they're doing and if they're prepared for it um, you know pretty much like the the quick survey that we just completed showed um, there's a misunderstanding of you know what connected and autonomous vehicles really mean not only for the the regular citizen but within the industry there's um, you know, a difference in understanding and perspective of what the technology entails. But through um, both uh, the literature search as well as the survey, we recognize some, some opportunities for us to, to um, go into as an MPO and, and with our partners. Uh, one was to establish a, a CAV uh, consortium. And this could be a, a forum where we exchange ideas, share knowledge on this technology. And we currently have one in place. Uh, it's not um, comprehensive. Uh, there are a few uh, operating agencies and, and um, public agencies that are participating in what's called the Central Florida AV Partnership. But we like to see if we can expound that to include uh, the other jurisdictions and operating agencies in our planning area. We um, see an opportunity to advance deployments, uh, but first doing more pilot testing. Uh, we can enhance our communication networks. Um, and part of that is, again, getting used to this, the idea that instead of transportation improvement being um, improving the road networks and capacity, um, but looking at how we can further our investments in new technology and leverage the technology investments that we've already made. Workforce is uh, a critical area. Um, as I mentioned, many of us in the industry are not really fully aware or informed on this subject, and that's okay. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a bad thing. Um, but as we are now starting to see uh, a lot of seasoned employees, uh, moving on into retirement, and a lot of that institutional knowledge goes with them. But we have existing talent that needs to be maintain their education through professional development activities. But then we have to look at the um, the generation that's coming through next, and what type of skill sets they're going to bring and knowledge in this area. Um, we, as an MPO, we see an opportunity to collaborate with our partners to look at um, training opportunities such as this webinar and, and other venues that we can bring to our partners uh, to enhance their knowledge and skills in this area. And then the last one here is one that um, I certainly have a, a lot of interest uh, in, and that's the equity challenge. And I like to describe it as is vertical equity and then there's horizontal equity. And the vertical equity has to do with the socioeconomics of our communities. And, um, you know, a story that I always like to use here that, that come, kind of summarizes my previous remarks is uh, former secretary of USDOT, Anthony Fox, who's also the former mayor of the city of Charlotte. Um, he used to say that, you know, when he was growing up, and the interstate system was built, and this is, you know, during the 1960s. Um, 
the interstate system came through and separated his community from downtown Charlotte, which reduced the, the, the accessibility to commerce, to education, to medical facilities. And he uh, suggested that we also consider that as we move forward in technology, that we don't allow technology to cut off access to vulnerable communities, to minority communities, um, to communities that have been left out of the process historically. Um, and that falls under environmental justice. The horizontal uh, equity deals with making sure that, um, for example, in our planning area, the city of Orlando is in Orange County. Um, but what Orange County deploys is compatible and interoperable with what the city of Orlando puts in so that travelers in our region continue to have that, that experience of regardless of what jurisdiction you're in, the road, the experience you're gonna have on that road is gonna be the same. So we wanna make sure that all of our partners are consistent in what we're doing so that as travelers come through our region, uh, that they can have the same experience regardless of what jurisdiction or community they are in. Uh, the public engagement workshops I mentioned earlier, uh, we had one in each of our counties. And uh, we did some, some, some surveying amongst the group. Um, and uh, I think I initially thought that um, I would be going into these workshops, interacting with uh, folks that didn't know a whole lot or, or, or did not have a favorable opinion of this technology, whether it was privacy issues or, you know, they seen the reports, you know, especially um, the one that happened in Phoenix with the crash. Um, and there's been some local crashes within the state of Florida uh, that um, I think have affected opinions of this technology. But you can see that there's, there, there is some enthusiasm for this technology. Um, and that was surprising to hear. Um, and, um, you know, that was something that, you know, we certainly uh, believe will help us in advancing this technology uh, in our planning process. Um, some of the concerns, as I mentioned, um, there is the, the issue of, you know, safety, privacy, data security, some of the challenges. Uh, vehicle technology deployment and the workforce tra the workforce training, um, and then data storage. Uh, you know, Dr. Patini mentioned that these vehicles collect data, and I often tell people that these vehicles are smartphones with tires or on wheels, and they're collecting data as well as sending data out. And then some of the opportunities: uh, there's educating the public, there's sharing of data and information. Uh, the equity challenge, and then looking at uh, pilot programs. So some of the recommendations, I'm um, we'll gonna go to the recommendation because um, you know, that is the, the, the part of the study that we want to make use of. <clears throat> um, and these are the five areas that we have uh, recommendations for, planning policy, infrastructure guidelines, data collection and management, pilot projects, staffing, and training. Uh, under planning and policy, um, I'm, I'm happy to say that, um, and, and staff at Metro Plan Orlando has done a great job of this, um, but we have um, a leadership board and we have committee structures and committee members and committees um, that over the years have been open to the whole use of technology and information communication to improve our transportation network. Uh, but we want to uh, continue that. We want to continue to provide them with, with information, um, educate them on this technology, and, and look to them to provide that leadership. Um, you know, one of the questions that we got at one of the workshops was, you know, so you're looking at allocating funds and resources from, you know, roadway capacity to uh, technology now. And, you know, the answer was yes, that's, that's part of it. You know, change has to occur and this is the type of change that we're looking for. 
So um, part of that change, um, in essence, is probably going to affect our um, the update of our Metropolitan Transportation Plan, which we are completing right now. Um, and it will also imp impact uh, the alignment of our committees and our partnerships. Um, we have a TISMO committee set, and, and that helps us with uh, deploying technology as well as funding projects. Um, but building partnerships is, is going to be uh, more critical um, with outside agents, uh, whether they are manufacturers, vendors, um, but building those partnerships so that we can do some testing, um, but certainly understand what they are proposing so that we can create an environment that allows these vehicles to operate. And again, the, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, we have uh, four scenarios in the plan. And one is you know, how do we advance or if there's an, an increase, an actual increase in, you know, all the, project, all the projections about this technology do occur, you know, how do we integrate that? Because it's, it's going to be a nuance. It's not going to be one day we turn on the, you know, we wake up and everything out there is a connected and autonomous vehicle. It's going to be gradual. And how do we align things so that we can, you know, have that occur uh, in a way that's not very disruptive. Um, the impact on land use um, is the first uh, item here. Um, you know, creating connected and autonomous zones in some communities, uh, working with the local jurisdictions on their guidelines and the regulations and practices uh, that will impact and affect how these vehicles operate. You know, parking is one of those big, big items that we have to look at and curb space management uh, because right now you have, you know, your transportation network companies that use a lot of that space. Um, you have uh, alternative modes of transportation that use that space. Um, so how do you integrate within your, your regulations or local regulations the opportunity for these vehicles not only to park but use facilities in your community? Uh, such as charging facilities for many of these vehicles because most, in fact, I believe the plan is for all these vehicles to be electric. And then the equity challenge, you know, I spoke, you know, more about that earlier, uh, so I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, these are some of the things that as our board, our governing board and local governing boards need to recognize. Infrastructure guidelines, uh, certainly, um, you know, one of the things that we have to uh, be cognizant of is, you know, upgrading and maintaining the the infrastructure in the digital infrastructure, sensors, uh, devices that uh, roadside sensors that are collecting data from these vehicles, uh, making sure that the intersections, which is where most crashes occur, um, you know, signal time or signal systems are working properly because um, the vehicles will communicate with, with our uh, traffic signals um, and making sure that payment and signing markings are up to date and maintained because these vehicles are operating like humans and they need to see which side of the road they need to be on in most cases. Um, developing guidelines uh, for deploying these projects, but making sure these projects are consistent with the, and many of you may be aware of the ITS architecture but making sure these, vehicle, these vehicles or the technology itself fits within our architecture. And then maintaining this, um, you know, it's not what it costs to build, but it, it is what it costs to maintain. And we need to make sure our resources are in place for that. Uh, data, um, this one's a big one. Um, you know, who controls the data? And, uh, how is that data going to be stored and, and how are we going to collect it? And that goes, this goes back to my comment about partnerships, working with the, the private firms that are putting these vehicles out, that are writing the code and the software for these vehicles. Um, you know, how do we, you know, get access to that? How do we maintain it and who controls it? Uh, how do we share it and who's going to be responsible for protecting it? Um, you know, data security is, is a big one, and uh, I have um, recently, for for you know, some of you may be aware of this program. It's uh, I don't think it's being aired on the networks. 
any longer, but I, I became aware of a show called Person of Interest. And it's all about, you know, data and, and surveillance. And so the big concern is, you know, security and who controls it. Uh, so this is going to take uh, some some effort, I think, um, and I'm sure that you know work is already being is underway, but it's something that we need to be aware of and, and do more work in. Pilot projects, um, you know, look at some uh, some some projects that are going to be germane to our planning area. Um, you know, the Orlando area is not like most urbanized areas. Uh, because we have, you know, the the, the big mouse and and all the other industries that uh, pretty much are leveraging that that existence in our community. Um, but we need to identify some projects that are germane to our area, uh, and working with our local uh, partners to gain insights on projects that we can we can deploy, we can test. And we have some on the way uh, right now. Dr. Patini mentioned that there are several in the state of Florida. And we, we have a couple uh, underway in our area. Uh, we have uh, one autonomous transit vehicle uh, study underway. It's a pilot. And our local uh, transit agency, Lynx, is developing a concept of operations for another one. Um, and then uh, two years ago, um, Metroplan Orlando partner with uh, Florida DOT District 5 and the University of Central Florida for a ATC MTD grant. And I'm using the acronym because I keep forgetting the actual words, but this is one of those. This is a federal grant that it's a recurring grant, $60 million every year, and it is to advance technology. And, and I want to give a plug to former Congressman John Micah, who is one of our big champions uh, in this area, and this is his legacy. Uh, to the industry. Safety, or excuse me, staffing and training. Some of this I already spoke to um, and Metro Plan Orlando is taking um, an active role in this area uh, and trying to work with local schools uh, to get some students to understand opportunities, career opportunities in transportation. I am one of those that, um, you know, after I completed my undergraduate work, I, you know, didn't know anything about transportation. Someone, you know, gave me a job lead and my response was, I don't want to be a bus driver. Well, you know, there's a whole lot of other things you can do in the industry, which I discovered and, um, you know, it's been beneficial to me. Um, but again, uh, helping with uh, making sure the talent pool that we have, we can keep. Uh, but also the talent that is being developed that we can attract to this industry and to this area, because this is where we're going to see a lot of attention. So what's next? Um, you know, we see Metroplan Orlando in this area serving as a conduit, convener, and collaborator uh, of how this this technology going to be is going to be advanced. Um, but it's serving as a, res a resource, um, not only to our clients, but to our partners uh, into the state of Florida in the industry uh, on this technology. Uh, we want to pursue some pilots and some of those I already mentioned that reflect local needs. Um, you know, look at available funds that um, we can manage uh, to support uh, not only deploy, I mean, pilot projects, but looking at where we need to apply those funds to ensure that the type of projects that are needed to support this technology will occur. And we'll get some of that through, you know, the update our Metropolitan Transportation Plan. So that concludes my presentation. And my understanding is that the questions and answers are going to take place at the end with a panel discussion. Great, thank you very much, Eric, for setting us up with some great perspectives about the uh, the future of connected autonomous vehicles and their impacts. And I think you you set us up well for thinking about the context in the sense that these uh, technology deployments are happening are and are envisioned for specific reasons, as you mentioned, improving safety, improving mobility. Um, reducing emissions, 
Um, and I think you correctly also addressed the very important equity questions. And um, so I think we're going to uh, do a couple more poll questions. I did want to mention that, um, that as Eric said, there are a number of um, pilots happening in Florida and there is a connected vehicle pilot happening in Tampa that the Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority has been leading for several years. This first question is, you know, have you experienced, had an experience riding in an autonomous vehicle? Uh, there have been many demonstrations and pilots and so uh, it looks like uh, about one third of the respondents so far have experienced an autonomous vehicle. I think having experienced one a few times myself, it is worth trying to have that experience. Um, last year, I was able to take a group of students uh, to, uh, to a demo and I think you learn a lot from, from other people's reactions also. Um, how does it feel to not be in control of the vehicle. Um, so yeah, it looks like about a little more than one third of you uh, in the audience have experienced that. So I think that's great. It's, it's um, I think when we're working in transportation, it is important because transportation is something that is deployed, that, that having the physical experience, um, oh, we're up to 39%, that's fantastic. Um, so, uh, Kristen, should we try the second one? Yeah, so this one is asking you, would you? So obviously some of you have already ridden uh, in an autonomous vehicle. So we're looking for what type of uh, transportation user you are. Are you a trailblazer? Um, are you never going to in your lifetime use a, an autonomous vehicle. So riding in an autonomous vehicle is one thing, but maybe you would allow an autonomous vehicle to deliver something to you. Um, this, the second tier, you know, once a majority of vehicles feature CAV systems, um, but about 70% of you are saying absolutely you would ride an autonomous vehicle. Um, there are so many uh, and have been so many discussions about the app different applications for autonomous vehicles for obviously for moving people in a, as a shuttle format for certainly there are um, different levels of autonomy. We haven't really talked about those levels yet, but some of you may, may have experienced uh, level one, which is uh, basically a cruise control, but at the highest level, uh, what we envision is that that this that the vehicles would be fully autonomous and that no human intervention would be needed. So it looks like 65% of you are saying absolutely, 24, 25% waiting a little bit for uh, for greater vehicle penetration, um, and then 3% are not interested at all, which is completely fine. Um, so I think that was that's good good indication of kind of where you are in your perspectives. Um, I think we'll move to our second speaker if that's okay. Um, so our second speaker, we're we're really grateful to have uh, Dr. Amr Alufa, who's a professor and director of construction engineering and management at the University of Central Florida. Um, Dr. Alufa is a PE with his PhD in civil engineering from the University of California at Berkeley. Go Bears, as a, another fellow Berkeley grad. Um, he's a past chair of the ASPE Construction Research Council and the Construction Division of the American Society of Engineering Education. Dr. Alufa has authored uh, over 180 uh, publications in transportation and construction, and his research is in the utilization of sensors for infrastructure applications. So, Dr. Alufa, I'll turn the turn the um, uh, the uh, the screen over to you. I would like to uh, thank uh, CFTPG and uh, FDUT for this opportunity to talk to you about our research. Uh, with my interest in construction, so this is uh, more related to. What do we see the, the impact of, of, of automated vehicles on infrastructure investments specifically 
uh, the roadways that will be needed to uh, uh, to be able to cope with the expected impacts of connected and automated vehicles. Uh, this presentation has been co-authored by my uh, student Sam Madavian. Uh, uh, Sam is going to be finishing his uh, doctorate at the end of this year, and uh, he is looking forward to uh, working in the industry uh, if there are any takers. Uh, we have also had collaborations from Dr. Naveen Oluru uh, of UCF, Dr. Haluk Laman of HNTV, and Dr. Ali Reza Shuaji of uh, Mississippi State University. So uh, I've already been preceded by uh, wonderful presenters that talk to you about how uh, connected and automated vehicle technologies uh, are impacting uh, uh, the future and how uh, the pace is, 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 is increasing. So our interest in this research is to say, okay, uh, we know there will be an impact. We know there are a lot of scenarios that need to be studied. How can we take into consideration these impacts and be able to forecast what are the potential changes to the traffic as a result of these changes? And then after that, come up with scenarios to find out as a result of these changes, how can we meet uh, uh, the requirements of the commuters, the requirements of uh, the freight industry uh, in terms of supplying the infrastructure that is necessary? Uh, I think I'm sure you're all aware of the emergence uh, of public-private partnerships and it is now widely recognized as one of the few ways that uh, we can really meet the, the future challenges. Uh, money is tight, uh, uh, industry has, uh, or the private sector uh, may have the funding, but doesn't have sometimes the, the, the uh, right of way, the roads and so on. Uh, the, the public has the, the, the land, but doesn't have the funding. So uh, the marriage of these two sides uh, is, 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 is a very promising trend. And we have already good examples, I-4 Ultimate, I-95 and other projects. So we, we wanted that to be also part of our study. Uh, and also uh, we, we, we did want to take a look at, in addition to these changes uh, and what is the required investment, uh, uh, especially also when it comes to toll roads. As you will see in my presentation coming up, also we have placed some focus on freight and on trucks. So we, we did separate car traffic, if you will, from truck traffic and then merge the two. So our model uh, would also incorporate the impact of freight. Uh, so what are the disruptive forces? Uh, my good colleagues have already discussed connected technologies, automated technologies, and described the difference. Uh, uh, electrical, change, uh, electrical technologies, population and urbanization changes, and Mr. Hill reflected on that. Uh, economic and workforce development, there are also political, fiscal trends, and environmental and energy trends in terms of greenhouse gases and the like that are all impacting our uh, future direction in terms of investment in transportation infrastructure. So we wanted to take a look at uh, the future uh, up to the year 2045, uh, considering the impact of automated and connected vehicles. And then also as a result of that, take a look at potentially meeting some of this demand through limited access uh, uh, freeways. And then the development of an investment optimization framework regarding, as I mentioned earlier, uh, triple T for highway construction. So in terms of the solution, how do we meet this expected impact? Uh, I haven't talked to you yet about the, the uh, uh, a calculation for what this impact will be, but how do we meet that, that impact? We can meet it certainly by smart transportation, uh, connectivity, uh, uh, either uh, automation and so on. We can meet it sometimes by con uh, converting some of the fleet. We can meet it by uh, 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 telling the public, and, and Mr. Hill in his study, I think, reflected on that, on this shared mobility concept that you don't have to uh, personally own a car, perhaps, uh, the ownership of the car can be shared amongst different people. And then, of course, regardless of any, any one of these, if you are using, if you're not using drones, you're not flying, uh, the issue of highway expansion, uh, we know there will be an impact. We know we need to meet it. So how do we meet it? We meet it by adding lanes. We meet it by perhaps constructing new roads in addition to the other changes that we discussed. So what's the goal? 
we want to present a bigger picture of the transportation network design obstacles uh, by developing or calculating what's the impact on volume and capacity, uh, uh, investigating scenarios to, 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 to calculate that impact, both short, long and long term. And then we also ended by developing a cost model uh, incorporating the major cost elements to try to give decision makers a tool for forecasting what is the future cost of uh, supplying this extra infrastructure to meet this expected demand. So we basically, and what I'll talk to you about are the three steps that we went through. Uh, the first one was developing a traffic prediction model. In this case, uh, without any uh, uh, input or without any contribution from connected and automated vehicles, and then we proceeded from there to find out what is the impact on this traffic model with the addition of connected and automated vehicles. And then uh, we took this, these results and put it into a cost prediction model to find out the expected cost of, of, of new freeways to meet this demand. So, uh, and, and thanks for the FDOT, we uh, collected data from uh, those, from all these sites. Uh, and, and uh, these were the highways that we considered uh, in our study. Uh, and then we took, took a look at uh, uh, independent variables, variables predictors, uh, construction market variables, energy market variables, uh, socioeconomic uh, autonomy variables, road characteristic variables, uh, temporal variables, and spatial variables. I've, uh, uh, because of the interest of time, I've just given some examples of, of what uh, is included in these, but uh, there, there are lots of variables that we, we took into our model. So we went into the pre-processing. We uh, took the data, of course, and we took part of the data, considered it a training set, uh, and then we uh, uh, took another part to validate this. And then, of course, we had to test this on a third scenario. This is to ensure the consistency and the accuracy of the results. Uh, and uh, as you can see here in, in, in the last step, we use machine learning algorithms, both linear and nonlinear, to try to get uh, a best fit. Uh, so uh, this slide just shows you how we sort of slid across the time scale uh, to develop training data sets, validation, testing uh, uh, in, in these various splits. Uh, we use both linear and nonlinear algorithms, and we found out that we do get uh, uh, better results. Uh, these percentages are error percentages, so obviously the lower the number, the better. So using MAPE uh, MAPE validation, we found out that this this does give us, uh, uh, relatively speaking, uh, pretty good results. And we found out that uh, from our model, the the most important factor, uh, as probably you would expect, is the number of lanes. Uh, uh, played sort of the biggest percentage, and then geometry of the roadway, the length paved, uh, population, co-site, and then maximum speed. This just means that what are the factors that we uh, we found from our model to to act, to, to, to be uh, uh, the major factors for uh, uh, attracting people to use a specific highway. So we also, uh, uh, so this, this concludes step one. In step two, we did an extensive lit literature review, and uh, from this literature review and from 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 what we found, uh, we came up with this sort of uh, uh, projection, if you will, uh, for uh, the x-axis is number of months and how, how we we see the increase will be uh, uh, using the literature that I've discussed earlier. So. What are the implementation forces? Uh, the maturity of the technology is very important, and I think Mr. Hill in his studies touched on uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, issues in his surveys, uh, the acceptance rate, uh, the trust, the tech familiarity, and then regulations and policies, uh, including privacy, security. Uh, so these are uh, uh, very similar to the findings that Mr. Hill reported to you uh, before this talk. Uh, so, uh, we do. We did see that the, we do. Are, we are expecting increased trips because of co uh, uh, connected and automated vehicle adoption. Uh, uh, in terms of the uh, comfort and utility in the car, 
uh, uh, there is going to be an impact from cars being empty going to other places. Uh, additional category of users, uh, the handicapped, uh, perhaps the, the elderly uh, that may, may, may now uh, uh, have an easier access to trips, increased safety and uh, potential reduction in energy and maintenance costs. In terms of what are the factors affecting the capacity increase, market penetration, uh, decreased headway, of course, the truck share, uh, speed increase, increased safety and uh, adding construction lanes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also did include the impact of trucks uh, uh, and, and, and the change that will do on, on, on the network. Uh, we took all of this, and I don't mean to, to uh, 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 confuse you, but this is what's called a system dynamics model uh, that sort of takes into consideration the impact of a lot of factors on other factors. So we developed a survey, and uh, this, this was the survey, and from this survey, we, we took a look at uh, uh, new, new behavior as a result of new technology. We took a look at new ownership models and uh, developed these scenarios, these extensive list of scenarios. And uh, just to uh, uh, share with you in the remaining time, the examples we found out. So for ex we did separate cars uh, from trucks. So four cars, uh, we, uh, we looked at a pessimistic scenario, most likely, and an optimistic. And again, these numbers are from directly from the survey that we had. So as an example here in the pessimistic scenario, we expect the number of tricks, uh, trips by cars to increase by about uh, uh, 4%, which is this one here, as a result of, 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 of an expectation of only a 10% cost savings uh, of using automated vehicles. Uh, in the optimistic scenario, as a result of all of these factors, we expect almost a doubling of the number of trips. So, so that's what these numbers actually mean. And we did the same for trucks. And uh, this shows you uh, the, what, 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 the num our numbers, again, for uh, new policies and new regulations. This is all summarized in this slide. So for example, uh, in, in this scenario that was indicated earlier, as a result of new behavior, new ownership models, and shared mobility, these are the factors that we would take in, would build into the model, and get its impact. I will conclude now by talking about the last part, which is the cost prediction model. We took a look at a lot of variables in terms of linear models, nonlinear models, and we found out a very good prediction accuracy for constructing these new highways. We did from that a cash flow analysis to aid the, the investors in, 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 in finding out whether it is worth it or not. And this is an example for a scenario at I-95. And this shows uh, uh, what is the uh, impact of having uh, uh, no new addition to the roadway versus adding lanes and a benefit cost analysis uh, uh, that, that we conducted uh, in order to help uh, decision makers. So in closing, uh, we are talking about uh, employing artificial intelligence tools using seven categories, a lot of variables, plugging this into a system dynamics model, and as a result, finding the impact on, on the Florida's uh, land use and potential also, of course, tall highways. And uh, I am out of time, so I want to thank you for this opportunity and looking forward later to the Q&A session. Uh, turning it over back to you, Dr. Bertoum. Great. Thank you, Dr. Alufa. It's a lot of wonderful information and um, very exciting project. Thank you so much. I did want to mention um, that one thing occurred to me, you know, as, I, as I've been working in this field for more than, in the CAV field roughly for more than 10 years, is that the, there are so many questions, but really most of the, most of the, the time, um, we're not thinking about either or, uh, we're thinking about and. So adding elements of connectivity and automation as a complement for other portions of the transportation system, so not so much uh, of a, of, as a replacement for, for the other things that we enjoy and that we appreciate and that we benefit from in transportation. But the question is how can we uh, move the needle in safety, in mobility, and in sustainability uh, beyond what we're able to achieve now. So a lot of these, a lot of the questions that come up 
are not so much about replace, replacing, but complementing. And, and I did want to mention, um, someone asked a question about data that, that uh, there is an ITS data hub at the US DOT website, um, its.dot.gov slash data that contains data from the um, connected vehicle pilots that have been ongoing in Wyoming, in New York City, and here in Tampa. So there, there are a lot of data, more and more data becoming available all the time. So Kristen, I think we have two more polling questions. Yeah, Dr. Bertini, I think in the interest of time, we're going to skip these poll questions. Um, we'll catch Very the next good. ones, but we'll go ahead and uh, hand things over to Dr. Lee. Very good, yes. Our third speaker is Professor Xiaopeng or Shaw Lee. He's an associate professor at USF in civil and environmental engineering. And he actually has two CAVs in our laboratory that he's been developing. Um, so I think he was the first uh, first professor in Florida to, to, to test, deploy, a connect an autonomous vehicle. So those vehicles have been tested not only here on the USF campus, but uh, on the SunTrax facility that we'll be hearing about next. And so Professor Lee is, um, he's a leader in uh, advanced network and traffic modeling with applications in connected autonomous vehicles. And he currently holds the Susan A. Bracken Faculty Fellowship at USF. And he also received the NSF Career Award and he's been uh, very active in research um, and has published uh, more than 60 journal papers. Um, and his bachelor's degree in civil engineering is from Tsinghua University in China. And then his MS degree and PhD degree uh, are from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. And we're so lucky to have uh, Xiaoping here with us. Um, so I will hand over to you. Hello. Good morning. Hi there. Good morning. Rob, thank you so much. I think you need to go to the, the full screen uh, yeah, slideshow view there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Thank you, Rob. Um, and I think um, CF that. Thank you, CF uh, TPG uh, for hosting this nice event, and also I appreciate the LTAP colleagues. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about uh, some empirical issues in planning for uh, connected and automated vehicles for CAVs. Uh, so the first issue will be related to the uh, road capacity factor, and the second issue will be related to the government's rule. Um, so, uh, regarding the highway uh, capacity, I think uh, this is a, uh, also mentioned about uh, the previous uh, presenter, the very nice presentation. So, this is very critical to transportation planning. Uh, and uh, some early predictions um, mentioned that. Um, the, their prediction was very optimistic. They said, um, you know, th the CAVs with um, automated control and communications could uh, increase four times of the existing road capacity. That uh, escalates the capacity to almost 10,000 vehicles per hour per land. Um, uh, in the full pure automated vehicle scenario, that's 100% penetration. And also there is prediction that uh, 40% of vehicles on the road will be automated by the year of 2040s. Um, so we would uh, see that this predictions uh, would imply significant uh, improvement of the uh, road capacity. Even with uh, partial penetration, we would see maybe a very high uh, improvement factor. And uh, in recent years, uh, some um, Pioneer planning models um, have already incorporated the CAV traffic in, and in particular, the impact of the capacity. Uh, and we know actually some of the software like Cube and Transcad uh, you know, have been widely adopted by planning agencies. 
And uh, in order to let them run for future CAV scenarios, you know, we need to have a capacity factor. And uh, I, from the capacity factors that I've seen in many models, and a common factor would be two times, that's 200% for the full um, uh, connected automated vehicles or 100% penetration rate. And as the penetration rate decreases, you can see as this figure shows, you know, that capacity factor decreases as well. You know, some assumes, uh, some just assume there is a simple linear relationship, uh, you know, that capacity increases linear with the CAV penetration. Others assume there could be some nonlinear relationship and the uh, improvement are most significant uh, you know, when you get a high CAV penetration rates and the improvements are uh, negligible at a very low CAV penetration rates. But on the very right top, um, still there is a capacity factor of two or 200%. Uh, while this capacity factor has been validated with some lab experiment in various um, ideal test scenarios, um, actually, it may not always be consistent with uh, what's actually happening or what's already happened. You know, if you look into the private sectors, um, automated vehicles are not a uh, future technology. They are, they have happened and already are happening. Actually, you know, one feature uh, that is commonly known as adaptive cruise control. Maybe many of you already have uh, that feature in your vehicles. Um, uh, this feature is basically available actually in um, for vehicles and um, just a range of around the 20k dollars um, in th this couple of years and they increase at a rate of 30 percent every year and you're going to expect a significant market penetration rates in the following years so they are already running and uh, adaptive cruise control is basically the automatic car following following the preceding vehicles and it's going to be the most critical technology that's going to impact um, our road capacity. And also, interestingly, there will be multiple levels of falling headway settings for most automated vehicles commercially available. You can set the headways either short or long, and that uh, apparently impacts road capacity. Um, and we actually recently did some field experiments uh, investigating the capacity of uh, these commercial automated vehicles with a ACCs. And we actually investigate the flow rate to density relationship you know, in this uh, figures, you know, vertical axis is the flow rate and horizontal is the density, traffic density. And for those of you who may know that these are actually fundamental diagrams. Um, <laughs> Uh, we actually plotted uh, uh, the, the, in this figure, is the, let's say the left figure is the uh, flow rate to density relationship for one automaker with ACCs. And it has four headway settings. You know, the, the top one corresponds to the shortest uh, headway setting, uh, the red dots, and the um, purple one in the uh, bottom corresponds to the lo longest headway setting. And you can see with the different headway settings, the flow rate vary, varies a lot. The figure in the middle is actually from another automaker and we tested the two headway settings and you can see also their capacities vary a lot based on different capacity settings. And the right figure is uh, the uh, benchmark current uh, human driven traffics um, flow rate to density relationship. If we compare these figures, we're gonna see that actually the capacity of at least of the existing commercial AVs may not always increase compared with the human driven vehicles. They may increase or decrease depending on their headway settings. And to the best scenario, you, you can see that uh, the maximum throughput will be around the 3000 range, whereas the uh, human driven vehicles uh, capacity range are around uh, uh, 20 to 2,500. So the in improvement is not like 200%. Um, um, so um, actually, we I want to compliment that um, a group uh, led by Christopher Sim Simprin from FDA District 1. We've been collaborating, investigating these issues and uh, they, ha they have been on the um, ahead of the curve in their regional planning models and trying to incorporate in these um, findings and concerns.
And also, why is that? You know, one one issue is we need to think about uh, the problems from different perspectives, especially from the automakers' mindset. Um, because these vehicles are made by automakers that may not necessarily concern about traffic performance, but rather they focus on individual driver's experience. Um, so in a way that the, the design, the AV uh, dynamic models may have problems for systematic uh, control, for systematic traffic. For example, one issue is called strain and unstable or strain instability. So in this figure on the left, it, it plots the speeds of a plateau of vehicles, vehicle zero being the lead vehicle and the, fo the, the following vehicles are following. And you can see lead vehicle speed drop will cause will be amplified to a greater speed uh, decrease all across the vehicles. And it's going to be amplified to stop and go vehicle, which is apparently not good for traffic. But actually, automakers probably don't care that much because such phenomena cannot be felt much by individual drivers. You know, they care more about individual driver's experience rather actually the systematic uh, performance of the traffic flow. So we need to think about uh, eventually in order to realize the predicted optimistic uh, capacity improvement, we have to work with different sectors to uh, get all the parties um, involved for to make vehicles not only automated, but also connected and cooperated. So this leads to another issue about government's role so, uh, or operator's role. How do we actually manage traffic? Um, so actually there is a, the, the tradition that there is a, sort of utopian mindset. It's like uh, the traffic operators can centralize and, and control everything in a centralized manner. Uh, so for example, in the animation on the left, this depicts what's happening at uh, um, signalized or in, uh, road segment. You can see vehicles when the, uh, this plus the, the vehicle trajectories that the vehicle passes over time. You can see vehicles may have stop and go patterns due to the alternating gray and uh, red cycles. But if you look at the figure on the right, this is the ideal scenario. So every vehicles are, every vehicle is centralizedly controlled and um, they will be perfectly platoon and they will have the smoothest trajectory to pass the uh, traffic um, intersection without stop in the nicest way with the maximum throughput and a minimum delay and, and energy consumption. So that's actually the ideal scenario. But are there issues, you know, uh, so the issues are these individual vehicles may not be fully cooperative or controllable. So like this, like vehicles are owned by individual drivers, you know, it will be an um, issue for them to uh, submit their, all their controls to a centralized operator. And also there will be too much liabilities and complexity for traffic operators. If you see this animation below, it's a comic animation, but it uh, depicts how complex the traffic pattern would be if we want to make things perfect. And I wouldn't dare to drive or walk in this kind of environment. And I don't know what the tra traffic operators be willing to assume such um, liability and complexity. So in, actually our professional organizations realized this and we actually recently issued a new standard called the uh, cooperative class. Um, you know, this is an, a new standard by Society of Automotive Engineers. If you look into this chart, and the whole, if you look into each column, these, these columns mark the different levels of automation that uh, um, all of you might be very familiar with. But if you look into these different roles, these are new things. We also specify different level of corporations, class zero being no corporation, uh, class A status sharing, class B intent sharing, class C agreement seeking, and class D prescriptive. This was just issued this May, so it's fairly new, but it uh, um, marks the, the recognition of different cooperation levels and behaviors. And so when we design that future like traffic tismo and relevant to management, we might want to follow this kind of cooperative control idea. You know, if infrastructural traffic operators might just need to provide guidance information, whereas vehicle control can be autonomous or they can control themselves based on their different cooperative levels. And we did uh, 
um, we worked actually with FHWA to develop their first set of Karmar use cases. Karmar is basically their uh, CAV platform. And we actually use this cooperative control concept. Uh, and we found that if the system's very well designed, you know, the traffic performance is almost as good as a centralized IBO control. And in the same time, the tra operator side of control is much more simplified and has much less liability, you know. Um, and to perform all these studies, you know, we, we do not only use, uh, we, we not only use a traffic simulation, but also we put forward a field experiment with our CAV test bed. We have two L3 CAV um, um, equipment here, and, uh, um, and we, we actually, we want to especially thank the support from the local community partners like uh, Soundtracks, First Garden and the USF campus for performing this ser series of experiments. Um, and this also brings us lots of impacts to the government's officials and the legislators. Um, and also we want to acknowledge great support from uh, FDOT uh, in many related researches. You know, the, the Carter has been done many, many research with uh, FDOT and recently there are several uh, highlighted ones with um, F dot uh, on CAV issues. The, this one is towards a uh, fluoride that uh, automated connected electric and shared. That's ACES transportation system. Um, and uh, this this project will lay a groundwork for ACES uh, transportation system roadmap. It is uh, managed by Dr. Raj Panaluja and um, the PI is Dr. Rob Bertini. Um, and also another example is about cybersecurity identify potential cyber vulnerabilities. And uh, this is uh, managed by um, Daniel Buildings and uh, Dr. Raj Panaloja. And also uh, this, the, uh, the principal investigator is um, Dr. Payson Lee and other collaborators. Um, so, you know, I finally, I want to acknowledge, um, you know, those researchers uh, that um, have been advancing the uh, relative research on, you know, in my group. And this is a, a link for my team members. You know, I have lots of wonderful students and collaborators. I also want to especially acknowledge the support from Carter colleagues and particularly uh, the, the leadership by Dr. Robert Bertini, you know, the, the lab um, and uh, lots of the research would not be possible without their support. And also the funding agencies, you know, they're actually the um, powerhouse to push this research forward. And finally, um, I want to thank all of you for for this uh, great opportunity, and uh, I'll be open to any questions in the end. Thank you. Great, and thank you, Xiaoping. I, I'm struck by your acknowledgement slide that showed all of the sponsors and partners, and I think that is definitely a theme when we're talking about CAVs, that it does involve a lot of collaboration amongst many, many different public and private organizations. I would also like to, I would like to add my acknowledgement and uh, gratitude to Dr. Raj Panaluri, who's the Florida DOT Connected Vehicles and Arterial Management Engineer. I believe he's actually attending this webinar. Um, so Dr. Panaluri, we're grateful uh, for your support and leadership uh, across the state and beyond. Um, and I know that, uh, when we were talking about data before, I understand, Raj, that, that uh, Florida DOT will be pursuing a statewide V to X data exchange platform and that that procurement is underway. So that's very exciting uh, for, for Florida. So lots of exciting things happening. Hopefully um, in the future, you'll be able to also connect with, uh, with uh, Dr. Lee, Xiaopeng Lee and uh, check out all of you have the, the opportunity to 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 meet him and his students and see the uh, the CAVs uh, in action uh, somewhere out in the field in the future. So I think we'll move to our fourth speaker and so Josh Peterson um, has worked in transportation for almost 20 years since he received his civil engineering degree from UCF and he served Florida's Turnpike for the last seven years in various roles. Currently as program manager, he's overseeing the management and delivery of over 120 projects and supports the Turnpike's $4 billion five-year work program 
It's an amazing, uh, amazing responsibility that you have. His recent projects include the conversion of 150 miles of the turnpike to all electronic tolling, a connected vehicle deployment in the Orlando area, and sun tracks. And so we're going to hear Josh tell us all about what's happening at SunTrax and the exciting future um, that, that we have in store for us. So Josh, it's all yours. Great, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks Rob for the introduction. Um, very happy to be here to tell you everything that's going on at SunTrax and our plans for the future. Uh, and I've really enjoyed these presentations. I think the hairs on the back of my neck are finally settling down after Dr. Lee's uh, continuous flow intersection there. That video was very good, but the research is really interesting on this. So I appreciate being a part of, of the panel today. Um, so without further ado though, we'll get into SunTrax. Um, maybe, there we go. Use the keyboard. So uh, SunTrax really has two missions. Um, so you kind of see there on the left and the right side of the screen are dual missions. Um, on the left, basically the whole project uh, came about because the Turnpike needed a place to advance its tolling technology. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, that was the genesis of the project. But then pretty quick, quickly we realized that we also had an opportunity to leverage our test track we were building to also accelerate connected and automated vehicle technology. Um, and so you see there the four kind of key items. Um, what we're interested in is as if to FDOT and FTE, we're really basically focused number one on improving safety of our systems, then enhancing mobility, reducing congestion and reducing environmental impacts. Many of the things that, that Eric talked about, um, but really what we were able to, what we kind of um, decided early on with the management foresight was that term, uh, Suntrax gives us an opportunity to really focus on the advancement of the technology itself, which is kind of the missing piece to all those benefits occurring. So before we go too deep into CAV, I'll just briefly talk about tolls testing. Um, so the Turnpike has been doing tolls testing for a long time. You can see here some previous testing locations on the right was actually an old uh, racetrack that the Turnpike used for a while. And then they moved over to the Suncoast Parkway live on our system um, to do some of the tolling technology testing. So those are obviously not ideal being either too small or causing disruptions to the public. So the project came about um, to, to find a new place where we can do controlled testing, repeatable manner, uh, make sure that all of our systems work before we roll those things out. Um, you can see there on the right, the, the tolls testing here. So it's really all about making sure that uh, our tolling transactions, which we generate over a billion dollars in revenue a year, um, are accurate and reliable for all the customers traveling on our systems. So we needed a place to prove those software releases out before we rolled them out you know, on system. And then also needed a place where we could test the hardware. Um, you know, we've got multiple different sensors, not quite like an automated vehicle, but we have RFID and camera and loops in the, in the pavement, and all those have to come together and be fused in the back office to create a, a transaction. So this gives us a place where we can do that in all types of different scenarios. It also gives us a place where we can start looking towards the future of tolling. Uh, you can see there's some of the, the things that are coming, GPS tracking, uh, mobile payment applications, and actually, when we talk about connected vehicles, there's some crossover there because one of the first applications that connected vehicles are likely to see are tolling um, so that you can actually pay your tolls through your connected vehicle rather than directly to a toll agency. So that's actually something we're already working with different um, companies on. And you can see there are just some of our capabilities. Uh, it's, it's a big site. We have reversible straightaways. The track itself is actually two and a quarter miles long. So if you remember that little racetrack that I showed you a minute ago, that's where it fits in, in comparison in size. So it's a really large site. The old track fits in one of our retention ponds. Um, we're at two and a quarter miles, just a little bit smaller than Daytona Speedway. Um, so we have a lot of opportunity to, to perform a lot of testing out here at SunTrax. So since we're really talking about CAV, I wanna shift over to CAV testing. Um, it's a whole different animal really than tolls testing or even kind of the traditional automotive testing that we're used to hearing about with things like, you know, head on collision tests or rear end tests and star ratings and things like that. What we're really looking at is um, actually making sure that a driving system is able to operate in the real world. So the challenges that come along with that are obviously there's a ton of complexity. Um, when we look at what it takes to make sure that we're confident in an automated driving system. It's all those edge cases of things that may not occur very often, um, but we have to have a good confidence level that a, that a driving system can handle those edge cases. Um, so that's where 
you know, the, the big challenge comes in is how do you standardize that? Um, how do you some, set some type of level of confidence of you know, how safe is it? Is it OK if it's safer than a human driver, but not perfect? Um, so those are some of the big picture challenges. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about a little bit, too, was what we've arrived at as, as the industry is that there are really three different types of testing needed. Um, simulation is obviously, obviously probably a big interest and, and a focus for this group today. We know that's where the vast majority of uh, miles driven, so to speak, will be performed. And a lot of those edge cases can be evaluated. We also recognize, as I guess the industry recognizes, that there's still a need for you know, vehicles out on the road so that they can discover areas that cause problems. And then there's still a big need for a controlled track, which is obviously what SunTrax is, um, where those types of scenarios can be played out, repeated over and over and controlled very precisely um, in a very safe environment. So moving on, I uh, wanted to talk briefly. There's a lot of different really industries and a whole cross section of groups that we've discovered and spoken to as we were both designing and now operating SunTracks. So the first ones that come to mind often are the automakers or the OEMs. And then of course there are tier one suppliers who supply a lot of the systems um, that go into a vehicle. Then there's another layer now below that that's emerged with uh, CAV and sensor or camera. Um, sensors, cameras, et cetera, companies that supply those. Technology firms, you know, Google is really recognized as kind of the leader in automated vehicles or autonomous vehicles at this point, but they're not the only one in the game. Then freight and logistics has been mentioned. Those will be a, a big um, potential user for us and, and some of the folks that we've talked to. I should have put universities and researchers at the top of this list um, today, but we understand there'll be a, a large need for research, you know, for the foreseeable future developers and even the insurance industry is another one because um, they have a vested interest in understanding you know, the actual safety of these vehicles. So lots of different really industries involved. Okay, so this is SunTrax. Um, I have a nice video. I don't think I'm gonna play it though in the interest of time. So I'll talk just for a few minutes um, about kind of what we arrived at and how with our design. So firstly, with the design principles, we recognize that it was very important to come up with as many different transportation environments as we possibly could to fit here uh, within the facility. And this is, um, we got about 200 acres here. So, you know, these are, we really tried to fill it up with as much as we possibly can, different types of transportation environments. Um, as you look at the test features list there on the left, you can see uh, the geometry track, for example, has a lot of varying horizontal and vertical curves. Uh, with some sight distance issues, I guess, that challenge the vehicles. You've got uh, urban, suburban, um, kind of an urban corridor there where we've got lots of signals, different intersection types, uh, various pavement markings and signage conditions. Then we've also got a pick up and drop off area. As Eric mentioned, we know that that will become more and more important. Um, so that replicates like an airport or a bus station where we've got lots of curbside interactions that can be replicated. Um, Sensor test chamber is a future area where we can actually control the weather, so to speak, control the, um, the precipitation and potentially even, uh, you know, like a replicating a bug. You know, bugs are actually a problem, not just in Florida with the love bugs, but all over the place um, and interacting with uh, or interfering with cameras on these vehicles. So lots of different transportation environments. The other thing we had to figure out was um, how to create different diversity of scenarios within those environments. So we've got hundreds, actually thousands of different scenarios that have already been created. Um, but, you know, we know that, that those will continue to change over time as the technology evolves. And so that takes us to the third point there, which is um, we want to make sure that the facility is very reconfigurable. We tried to kind of make it as, as changeable as possible, not put too many foundations or permanent fixtures in the ground, but um, make a lot of ways where we can reconfigure the site going forward. So we have a nice video here. Uh, I'm going to maybe just pick a couple spots, but I'll probably ask you to go out and use this as a chance to plug our website, suntracksfl.com. Um, so I know this is kind of jerky on your screens right now, but I'll just kind of move forward. This is our uh, entry campus area. So we've got a large arrival and conference building. And then we also have um, some state-of-the-art workshops where users can basically have everything that they might need in order to go perform testing. But I'll just jump forward a little bit on the video. Here you're seeing as we kind of pan across some of the actual test sectors in the interior of the facility. So you will kind of be able to see some, some automated, automatic braking tests that are occurring. You know, that's a, obviously kind of a mature technology that we already have. 
um, but there are lots of different opportunities for testing on the interior tracks there. Now I'm gonna actually jump a little bit further ahead. Now we're in the vehicle and um, this is driving now through our urban uh, corridor area. So one of the things that we're doing that's kind of interesting is using shipping containers. And um, that goes back to the diversity and reconfigurability I was talking about earlier. Um, we can use shipping containers to reconfigure all these uh, environments, urban environments into different um, conditions that will have, a, have an effect on um, what the sensors in the vehicles do. So for example, you know, we have some facades that we've already built where we can put either metal or glass or um, concrete facades on the shipping containers. Those will interact differently with the sensors. And we can also move these things around to create things like uh, urban canyons, if you're familiar with that term, where there's GPS interference um, that would impact the vehicles. So I'll go ahead and move past this and just, uh, again, ask you to go check out suntracksfl.com, um, where you can see that video. It's actually in, um, in 3D, so you can move it around. And we also have out there some live cameras uh, showing uh, the construction that's ongoing in phase two now plus lots of other information. Uh, and then before I close, I just want to point out another kind of innovation that we're doing out at SunTracks, which is the, the organizational structure is also relying on uh, private industry and some expertise that's already existing out in the, in the private industry. So what the Turnpike is doing is procuring a third party operator rather than trying to run this facility um, you know, from scratch. So we're bringing that operator on, they'll perform basic day-to-day -day operations and maintenance but also some of the business aspects like uh, sales and marketing, billing, reservations, those types of things. And they'll, um, more importantly, really be able to offer a suite of services to the different users. Um, so beyond just the leasing of the individual or combined test sectors, they'll also be able to, to develop test scenarios for customers and up to even performing the full service testing if that's a, a desire from a customer. So, oh yeah, one more project timeline. Just wanna show how it's, moved relatively quickly for such a large infrastructure project. So back in 2015, we began the facility design. And then by the summer of 2017, we were finished with our phase one construction, which was the aerial you saw there of the high-speed oval, and began our construction. Then moving into 2019, we have, uh, had completed lots and lots of iterations of the design by that point, um, and completed our infield design in summer last year as well as opening the high-speed oval for testing. So we've been using the oval as, as the turnpike for tolls testing since that time over the last year. And then looking forward in 2021, the very end of calendar year 2021 is when we expect to complete construction uh, of the overall infield and have the full facility be started up and running. And then one last slide, I guess, to show, to talk about Florida for a second. Um, it's not necessarily the first place you think of when, when you talk about either, you know, high tech industry, maybe is California or the automotive industry is maybe Michigan. But we actually have a lot going on in Florida. You've heard a lot about that from some of the other presenters here. Um, but we have, first off, a, a very friendly regulatory climate. That's the picture of Governor DeSantis, uh, his second trip out to SunTrax when he signed our latest CAV bill last year. Um, we also have great roads, as probably most of you are aware, so that is, makes us a good place to begin a deployment of an automated vehicle. Lots of research and, and uh, kind of a business-friendly environment and ecosystem that you've heard about today. And we shouldn't really underestimate the weather because that's, that's actually become a big uh, selling point, at least for us at SunTracks, as um, companies want to come down here and test in the winter. And actually, they want to come and test in the summer, too, because we have a lot of rain. And we're finding out that uh, that's, a, that's a big area that a lot of car companies are, or I should say automated vehicle companies are looking to, um, to test in. Okay, so that wraps up my portion. Thank you again to the organizers and for having me on. Looking forward to the panel session. Great, thank you so much, Josh. And I believe the panelists, if you could turn on your cameras, uh, then we'll all be able to see you. you. Uh, there's Dr. Alufa. And so I would like to prompt, get the discussion going with one question that, that we were gonna ask earlier um, as a poll. Uh, and we've talked a bit about the many different uh, collaboration opportunities and we've talked where we've uh, addressed the urban rural um, opportunities. So think of, so we'd like to know your initial reactions to, um, you know, what do CAVs 
uh, do to uh, to give us the opportunity to think about the future of cities and the future of transportation. And many of you have already mentioned a lot of a lot of these points, but how do you think CAVs fit in um, to the future of cities and transportation? And the poll here is set up on the screen. Um, there are obviously funding issues. There are obviously issues of, uh, you know, you can't flip a switch and deploy CAVs everywhere. So there's going to be a mix of vehicles operating. And then um, Xiaoping has already talked about some capacity issues. But maybe as the, the, the participants respond to the, this uh, polling question, um, who would like to start? Eric, would you like to start? And unmute yourself. Um, I think there, there was a question, I saw a question, um, and this is, um, I think uh, applicable certainly to cities because uh, it's their urban areas. Uh, but this one had to do with, um, and it was an equity type question. And so I'd like to just jump into that one real quick um, when talking about, you know, cities and the future of cities and what it means because what will happen in the future is that our cities will become more cities of color. Um, you know, that's what the, demogra the dem demographers show. That's what they predict. So, you know, how will these vehicles start to be able to better detect people of color? And, um, you know, that's a concern. And I, I think that in a trying to address that concern is an opportunity where we can start to do more testing in that area and ensuring that the type of staff or people that are developing this technology, that they become more aware and cognizant of that. Um, so that's one. And then the other one is just land use. How will impact land use? You know, are we going to start to see less and less parking facilities? Um, since one of the one of the scenarios is people won't own vehicles any any longer. So will we need to have the, the parking capacity? that we have in cities. And then related to that, how will it impact the revenue um, that is generated as a result of, of car ownership, car operations? And that is parking, uh, vehicle miles travel, fuel use, all that's going to impact cities um, as a result of this technology. Thank you very much. Do any of the other panelists have a, a, a comment to add? If I may uh, 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 jump in, I think the issue that is raised by Mr. Hill is very important, the issue of equity. I have a, a, a maybe a minority opinion that it may actually improve the equity issue as a result of potential reduction of transportation costs. Uh, we have, you know, we all witness a, a rather poor public transportation problem in the United States. Uh, Every time you go to a bus uh, uh, owner, they all, it's always about getting more money to buy more buses that run half empty all the time. If we have a good uh, uh, program, good automated vehicle program, potentially the right cost may be very, very low. Uh, the average car sits about 23 hours unused. Uh, if we can increase substantially the usage rate we can potentially reduce the cost and allow uh, communities that are now underserved perhaps a lot better access to transportation, which, as we know right now, is affecting their ability to get employment, is affecting their ability to get better education. So I see a silver lining uh, in, in, into solving or partially at least addressing the equity issue through hopefully drastic reductions in the cost per mile of movement as a result of better utilization of vehicles. Thank you very much. Yes, reducing the cost of transportation is I think a key ingredient in a lot of the a lot of the CAV uh, thinking for the future. Uh, Josh or Xiaoping? Sure, I'll jump in. I think, um, you know, for, for me, I suppose I would say safety is really the, the main thing. And that's for us in our outlook, it's really coming back to the technology and does it work yet? Right. Uh, so, you know, the very first thing before we can have any of these other conversations is to make sure that the technology actually is mature enough and safe enough um, to be deployed on our system. And we're not there, you know, at this point with the industry, we're getting closer, uh, but it's not quite, you know, fully, fully baked at this point in time. So I think that's the, the key issue 
Uh, and then, you know, moving forward, it's probably the other two items that I think I just weigh in on are, you know, traffic. I think uh, Dr. Lufa showed some really interesting research earlier about um, this is actually likely to increase our traffic as at least automated vehicles are deployed if we don't somehow uh, find a way to, you know, counter that with the sharing piece as well, right? So that if the vehicle miles are actually going up, um, you know, how do we figure that out so that it's not just creating more congestion on our system? I think those are the, the main concerns. Uh, and then, of course, from the turnpike side, where we're interested is the, the funding aspect. You know, if electric vehicles are coming on and we're having gas tax reductions, um, it might be something that drives us more towards a overall vehicle miles tolling situation. Um, and connected vehicles can also play a part in that. So kind of see technologies converging there. But I think really for us, safety is always the first thing. So we we are um, we are I lucky to we have a special uh, yes. Yeah, Sean P is trying to say something. Yeah, you're unmute. Yeah. I think you're muted. No, you're not. Okay. Yeah, I'm on mute. Yeah, and I, I I have to get the organizers' permission to be unmuted. Well, thank you for unmuting me. Um, so I just want to follow up uh, the uh, equity and the uh, cost issues. Uh, um, so recently, yeah, we've been working with uh, WSP on a FHWA uh, project uh, for um, CAV accessibility affordability. And we actually uh, exactly used the vertical and horizontal analysis, and we were using um, a cube and also the um, activity-based uh, transportation planning models to look into that. We're still in the middle of the project, but we see here is the two things interesting about the cost. So if you look at the individual autonomous vehicles cost, it's way higher than the current uh, passenger vehicles, at least with the existing technology. Um, in order to make it, a, you know, uh, run uh, uh, robustly. But if uh, you can buy autonomous vehicles with shared mobility, you know, the cost will be much um, reduced and that's going to um, much uh, increase the, the utilization of this technology and accessibility of it. Uh, so we would see that then, you know, if only autonomous vehicles are available as pri mm, private vehicles or passenger cars, you know, the, the then only the group of rich people can access that technology. But if it can be made shared, you know, people uh, that, uh, you know, the, the cost will be much reduced and it's gonna help with the accessibility. Um, yeah, so so it, it really depends on the, the technology evolves. Um, and uh, um, um, regarding the safety, it's, um, we actually, found out that there is some trade-off between safety and mobility you know so we did some uh, recent experiment if you're for example i mentioned about four different headway settings um about uh, the existing a acc vehicles you know i, I think uh, that's a foundation for longitudinal control for all the automated vehicles so, but if you set a very long headway you know the safety indicator is much more improved based on our um experiments it, it, but actually, you know, the headway is long, the mobility is not that good. And maybe, you know, there could be some induced issues. Some other people could cut in, you know. So so there is some interesting aspects. It, 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 there is lots of trade-offs. So, you know, we, we, we may want to look into all these issues uh, in a holistic, uh, you know, more of the um, related in, interdependent uh, perspective. So that's my feel. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, I think there are opportunities for, for everyone to be engaged in, in this issue, not only in, in terms of equity and not only in the, in the sphere of CAVs, but just more broadly in transportation and in society in general. So I'm grateful for your, your responses to that important question. I think we do have a special unannounced, unadvertised guest. I believe that uh, Dr. Raj Ponaluri has joined us and is able to chime in now. So Raj, are you able to unmute and um, offer us some of your comments? Uh, Dr. Bertini, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. I mean, we have great speakers, so 
all I'm going to do, Dr. Bertini, is um, just convey some key points because I see a lot of questions that came up about, say, data, for example. And as I mentioned in my uh, chat response, uh, Florida DOT is uh, in the process of developing a statewide data exchange platform. It is called the V2X, X stands for other, meaning vehicles, bicycles, pedestrians, transit, freight, you can replace X with anything. Um, so a V2X data exchange platform, invitation to negotiate, uh, that's another form of a, an RFP in a way. Uh, that procurement is underway, so I won't talk much about it. We just deployed uh, a statewide security credential management system or SCMS platform. Uh, and, and the reason I'm, I'm saying all these things is because I'm trying to respond to as many questions as, pos as is possible. Um, interoperability, Ken Sides brought up a question about interoperability. That is a great question. In fact, uh, industry also is, uh, I'm going to say, facing the challenge of how to make interoperability happen. If you have certain roadside units from a particular vendor in Tallahassee, you have a different type of roadside units in Gainesville and another roadside unit uh, uh, in uh, Pinellas County or another one in uh, on I-75 frame projects or I-4 frame, I can go on and on. But the point is eventually there should be a common language that needs to be utilized in the CAV uh, way of talking about it uh, from an interoperability standpoint. So that is another great question. Another question was about the FCC spectrum. Um, well, uh, as all of us know, the Federal Communication Commission has decided to reallocate the 5.9 gigahertz uh, uh, spectrum, the 75 megahertz uh, of the 5.9 gigahertz um, uh, between CV2X and DSRC. Uh, that is still a notice of proposed rulemaking NPRM. It is not finalized because when it is finalized, it goes into what is called the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulation. All said and done, um, industry as well as uh, uh, state DOTs and local agencies are preparing uh, for this uh, possibility of the uh, spectrum being reallocated. Um, I can go on and on with all the questions, but I think the key point to drive it at this stage is that um, Florida DOT is working very closely with local agencies in the state of Florida because this is an LTAP uh, uh, training. I think LTAP item, it is important to mention that the districts have been uh, informed about a funding opportunity in the sense, a partnership opportunity with local agencies. It is called TAPS-LA, which stands for Technology Applications Partnerships with Local Agencies. Our district officers have been reaching out to the local agencies for potential partnership uh, projects. We already heard some encouraging notes on that. Um, there's many research projects that are underway. I'm not going to go through the uh, huge list of items. Um, but if you ask the Florida DOT uh, folks who work in the emerging, emerging technology, the TSM and the ITS and the traffic operations realm, you keep hearing the term called vital few. Anybody at Florida DOT knows what vital few is. Uh, there are four specific items improving safety, uh, embracing, uh, 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 improving safety, enhancing mobility, uh, inspiring innovation, and then collaborating for workforce development. So these are the four major themes and Florida DOT is doing everything humanly possible to make sure we put the right kind of um, um, resources uh, and make them happen so that eventually the road user, whether it is the vehicle or whether it, whether it is a driver or a pedestrian or a bicyclist or a transit uh, uh, rider or a bus driver, I mean, the, the freight folks, everybody gets to eventually benefit from uh, deployments and implementation of emerging technologies. Um, industry collaboration is absolutely key. We heard a lot of great things today during the panel discussion. Um, Suntrax is going to be one of the centerpieces of all the testing in the state of Florida. It is, in my opinion, it is going to change the way um, uh, the world looks at testing because at no other place would you ever see any testing of the toll systems in an emerging technology realm. Suntrax is going to offer that. It is uniquely positioned. All Satchfield and Florida Stone Park Enterprise with Josh Peterson, they're all doing a great job. Um, uh, I'm going to say one thing and I'll stop. <laughs> uh, eventually, the DOT district office this is where things happen. There's eight districts at the Florida DOT from the central office 
the leadership provides all the guidance, the support, the funding opportunities and whatnot to implement these technologies. But we have a well thought out CAV business plan, connected and automated vehicles business plan. It is a 10 page document. It talks about what, you should, what we should be looking for when we consider technologies, the feasibility, the implementation, et cetera. Um, we can't go through all the questions, but they're all great questions. I mean, it goes to show the level of interest folks have when it comes to emerging technologies. Uh, I think it's reasonable to say that all pieces are coming together, meaning the industry, the state entities, the local agencies, the academia, university partnerships. Um, FIU does some great work uh, in this realm with connected vehicles. So does UCF. I mean, USF Cutter, we can go on and on. University of Florida, they all play a significant role, the Florida family, FSU. Um, so eventually uh, our goal, once again, one last time, is safety and mobility. And I'll keep saying that because whatever projects we take up, whatever programs we take up are meant to make sure we get some outcomes, which is reduction in crashes, hopefully vision zero someday, um, clearing the traffic as quickly as possible and implementing systems that would help all road users. And then collaboration with the Karma, Federal Highway Administration and others is another important part of the equation. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Bertini for leading the ACES uh, initiative from US of Qatar. And Dr. Lynn does a great job with LTAP. So uh, thank you all. Judy, thanks to you as well. Thank you, Dr. Bertini. Thank you so much, Raj. And I posted, hopefully everyone can see in the uh, question response chat, uh, a couple of the links that Raj mentioned, including the, the F.CV uh, initiative webpage and also the um, uh, business plan that he mentioned. So those are available. Uh, so we have just a few minutes. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, a lot of questions came in about readiness, about technology, but maybe I could just ask for 30 seconds from each of the panelists just to comment about uh, the concept of readiness. How do we increase our readiness and at the same time make sure that all voices are being heard and maybe also indicate how some of the participants could get involved because certainly many it takes many hands to to make uh, a successful future and we've got about 300 people here on the on the webinar who are certainly engaged in this topic so um maybe we'll go in uh, reverse order to we what we did a minute ago Xiaoping, do you want to start just 30 seconds in closing I'm not seeing audio. There we go. Maybe I, there we go. I want to th thank everyone for this uh, great opportunity and especially the um, uh, leadership um, from Dr. Raj Panaluri and uh, also, also all partners. And I, I, I would always envision this is going to be a, a group and, and a collaborative effort. And we want to make autonomous vehicles, automated vehicles, cooperative and collaborative. And as um, all different parties, I hope we can also work in a cooperative and collaborative manner. Thank you. Thank you, Xiaoping. Uh, Josh? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll jump in next. First, I'd like to know, how did Raj go th get the chance to go through every single question and didn't even show himself? So Raj, you know, if we're gonna cooperate, you gotta show yourself on camera and don't steal all of our thunder there. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, of course, Raj is amazing. Um, I'll, I'll try to hit a couple of topics, I guess, um, Rob, from your question there. Uh, I, I think one of the things, th the way we look at it or that sometimes gets confused is, and I noticed this on one of the questions in the chat box as well, is the difference between kind of connective, connected vehicles and automated vehicles. So on the one hand, really automated vehicles have to be able to operate kind of independently themselves with their own suite of sensors. They can't really depend on um, investment from, you know, from government agencies really to, to work. They have to be able to work on their own with the existing, you know, striping and signage that are out there in the system. 
but on the other hand, I think that we all have an opportunity to uh, collaborate more in terms of, you know, what do we need to do for our infrastructure to make sure that it accommodates that or, you know, different research and different ways that we can make sure that those stand, what the standards are gonna be for automated vehicles. Um, so I guess I'm kind of echoing Dr. Lee there in that I think what we can really do is work to create better um, collaborative environments and exchanging data together um, to try to figure out kind of what that industry standard needs to be. Thank you very much. Uh, Amber, any closing comments? Sure, thank you, Rob. Uh, I'm just, uh, I was really excited to hear uh, Josh's uh, presentation on SunTrack. I think we are in a situation where the industry and implementation is well ahead of, of, of research. And I really think that what will convince the public is not necessarily a utopian view of what could happen, but the potential, and I, I believe a huge improvement that, that can come as a result of, 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 of uh, furthering these technologies. We all heard about you know, some accidents that occurred in automated vehicles, but we always forget when we read about these, about the number of accidents that occur in non-automated, non-connected. So technologies will always fail uh, at some point, our job as, as, as researchers and the industry's job is to make it as safe as possible. But I, I think this, this over reliance on, on a utopian view uh, may not necessarily be serving us well. I personally believe that as a result of what industry is doing, as a result of, of, of uh, visionaries like Musk and so on, I do believe that we'll start seeing applications that were never ever imagined at very relatively low prices that will bring in a revolution very similar to what the internet and the information technology brought in. Thank you. And uh, just wanted to mention in closing that my student Sam has uh, is expected to finish his PhD in December and is looking for a job. So if any of the 300 uh, X plus people is looking for employment for somebody to, to a great person, uh, he's gonna be available. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> Thank you. And Eric, uh, two seconds of in closing. Two seconds. Yeah, and uh, Josh hit one of them, and that is we got to make sure that this works, okay? Right now, it's theoretical. We got to make sure this works. And then the last one ties in with Amir said, um, we have to come outside the bubble, and we have to convey this to our clients um, to make sure that they are informed. Perfect, perfect uh, notion on which to end. So I want to thank you all and thank all the participants and hand it over to Kristen for uh, closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Bertini. So just want to let everybody know that um, there are some questions we didn't get a chance to get to. So we are going to uh, try to get back to, the, to you with the answers, put together a Q&A document. We're also kind of considering doing a follow-up Q&A panel discussion, maybe to just uh, answer some more of these questions we didn't get a chance to get to. So we'll definitely um, let you know via email if anything is scheduled coming up. And uh, let you know when you exit today, a survey will launch. If you can take a few moments to fill it out and let us know um, how we did. And with that, Dr. Bertini, I'll hand things over to you to wrap it up. I think there's not much more to say other than thank you. And I love the idea of following up because there were some great questions. And uh, certainly, I'm sure uh, myself and all the speakers, anyone who would like to contact us directly, you can find our email addresses online and um, be happy to keep the conversation going. So, so be safe, everyone. Take good care. And thank you for participating. This was wonderful. Have a great day. Thank you. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thanks.